In this Episode 8, Masters of the Air Cliff, we see P-51 Mustangs attacking a radar installation with machine gun fire and rockets. The fighters are piloted by the Tuskegee Airmen from the 332nd Fighter Group. The intent of this video is to check the clip for historical accuracy and point out 8 narration inconsistencies with reality. The channel has produced 15 Masters of the Air fact check videos looking at the series narrations, tactics, and hardware discrepancies. With every fact check video I get in the comment section, hey man, this is a Hollywood movie or series, not a documentary, rivet counter. The series relied on 16 historical consultants, military advisors, and technical advisors as seen in this credit list. Tom Hanks relayed to the production team these key principles as defined in this Donald Miller interview. Miller is the author of the Masters of the Air book. Don't make anything up. No BS. Just tell the story. The real story is fascinating enough. Don't exaggerate. Catch the mood of Das Boot. Don't make it an over-the-top Hollywood piece, but war as it actually occurred. In meeting these tenets, I would give the series a D-letter score based on the dozens of misrepresentation of events, unneeded exaggerations, and embellishments. The Episode 8 Tuskegee mission is real and took place to support Operation Dragoon, the invasion of southern France. The radar attack mission occurred on August 12, 1944, three days prior to the invasion, which occurred on August 15. The Allies wanted another path through France, help divert Axis forces away from the Normandy beachhead, and have another secure French supply landing area. This map from a 1945 document titled Atlas of World Battlefields and Semi-Monthly Phases outlines Reich-occupied territories as of August 1, 1944, around seven weeks after the D-Day invasion. The Allies were just starting to break out of the Normandy area from the results of Operation Cobra. The Tuskegee Airfield is located about here, operating within the 15th Army Air Forces. Just 15 days later, we can see the advancement of the Allies through the Brittany Peninsula and the start of Operation Dragoon along the French Riviera. Two weeks later, on September 1, 1944, all Allied armies are progressing rapidly, crushing German opposition. The Tuskegee 332nd Fighter Group was assigned to take out radar installations in the assault area, as discussed on this page from a 1992 Center for Air Force History document titled The AAF and the Invasion of Southern France. They attacked multiple installations as to not to jeopardize the actual landing area. The invasion beaches are shown on this map from a 2016 U.S. Army Command and General Staff College document titled Operation Dragoon, The Race of the Rhone. The radar installation attacked is located in the port city of Toulon. The overall results of the radar sites attacked are summarized on this page. Of the 22 radar stations attacked, only 5 were put out of service and 4 were probably put out of commission. The results of the radar site attacks were classified as not very satisfactory, although the important stations within the landing areas were put out of operation. It is unknown if the Toulon radar station attacked by the Tuskegee Airmen was operational or not. Okay, let's address some mission narration issues. To increase range, extra fuel is carried in these 75-gallon droppable fuel tanks. These fuel tanks are period correct. However, the Mustang models depicted in the clip are not period correct for the mission. The 332nd transitioned to Mustangs about a month earlier in July 1944. However, they were initially supplied with P-51B and C models, not the P-51D models as shown in the clip. The earlier P-51 models are also known as the P-51 Razorbacks and can be distinguished by the framed hinge canopy and were armed with four machine guns while the later supplied D models were equipped with a sliding bubble canopy and were armed with six machine guns. This image, taken four days prior to the August 12th mission, are Razorback P-51s, given its frame canopy and two machine guns per wing. Additional justification for this premise is provided on this page from a 2011 Maxwell Air Force Base historical research document titled Tuskegee Airmen Chronology. A summary of the August 12, 1944 mission lists P-51Cs as participating in the attack. Another major error is the Mustangs are equipped in attacking the radar installation with HVARS, or High Velocity Aircraft Rocket. These rockets were introduced around three weeks earlier in the European theater, as shown on this page from an October 1944 intelligence impact document. They were mounted on P-47 Thunderbolts. The results were considered spectacular. The P-51B and C models were not equipped with rocket launch rails. This image shows the HVAR launch rail. The launch rails were added to the D models, like seen in these images. The mission plan called for strafing the radar site with machine guns.
On the attack run, the Mustang fired their machine guns way too far from the target. The effective range of a fighter's 50 caliber machine gun is within 400 yards, as discussed in these fighter gunnery manuals and these channels videos. Looks like he opened fire at ranges over a thousand yards. This is bad gunnery practice and a waste of ammo. The gyroscopic K14 computing gun sight is shown. While consistent with the D models, the Razorback P51s should have been sighting the target with the older reflector N3 model, as shown in these images. This image, dated August 8, 1944, shows the correct N3 model gun sight and the adjacent backup ring sight. The radar structures in the clip are the giant Wurzburg and the girder chimney. These radars are period correct and were part of southern France's early warning system. This page from a March 1945 Air Intelligence Group document titled Japanese Electronics shows the German radar towers and structures adopted by the Reich. The giant Wurzburg is shaded here and the girder chimney here. The girder chimney's early warning radar is attacked by the Mustang's rocket in this clip. The radar had a range of around 125 miles. The radar's tower is 115 feet high. The rocket would not behave as shown in this attack clip. This page outlines a cutaway and components of the HVAR air-to-ground rocket. The warhead contains 8.2 pounds of an explosive fill and 24 pounds of a propellant. The rocket can be configured to detonate either by contact for light structure targets like radar towers, or with a small time delay after impact for hardened targets like tanks or concrete bunkers. This depends on the few selected to start the warhead's detonation train. This can be ascertained by looking at the rocket's nose. The Mark 149 contact detonation nose fuses have been replaced with armor piercing nose caps in each of these rockets. The rocket's detonation fuse selected was incorrect. The rocket's detonation train should start at impact, not fused for a time delay for a hardened target. The rocket should have been configured with the Mark 149 nose fuse as seen in this image from a 1960 aircraft rocket manual. I would have expected to see the rocket with the correct fuse nose cap and arming wires visible like in these images. Because of this nose fuse swap, the rocket's warhead detonation train will be set off by the Mark 159 base fuse, which will have a 0.015 second time delay at impact to detonation, or an additional 23 feet of rocket travel after impact to detonation, if not slowed down. This can be a problem when attacking the girder chimney radar as a rocket will detonate past the framing, but the bigger issue in the clip narration is related to the fuse arming sequence. For safety, the fuse will be armed to detonate 0.1 seconds after the propellant has burned out and the rocket acceleration has stopped, as defined in this May 1945 Rockets and Fuses document. The rocket burn time equates to 1.2 seconds, as defined in this October 1944 Intelligence Impact document. The rocket will be armed around 1.3 seconds from launch. If the rocket contacts a structure at a duration less than 1.3 seconds from launch, it will not detonate, just pass through. The rocket's duration from launch to radar structure contact in this clip equates to 0.7 seconds. In this slow motion clip, we can see the rocket's propellant still burning at contact. The Mark 159's fuse is not armed when the rocket contacts the radar structure. It should not have detonated. The pilot fired the rocket too close to the target, not allowing for the arming distance needed. In this clip, the P-51's left wing is struck by a German AA projectile. The damaged left wing has lost some lift. The plane should roll to the left, since the right undamaged wing can still provide full lift. The plane is rolling in the wrong direction. In summary, the Masters of the Air series did not seem to make much of an effort to fact-check the technical narrations in the episode. The eight inaccuracies in this episode 8 attack narration are listed here. Do you agree with the inaccuracies as listed? What letter grade would you give the series for historical accuracy? If you've enjoyed this Masters of the Air Tuskegee Attack Narration Fact Check Review, please consider commenting, liking, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.